Well, here we are, with our new episode, new Redneck TV episode, uh, 11. Could it be episode number 11? Redneck TV with Kat. And Scott. And Scott. And Scott. Uh, this time nobody's shooting in the back. And you didn't trip over the chair. Yeah, the which kid. is quite bizarre. Maybe nobody's shooting because we were shooting earlier. Yeah, I don't think they got a response quite yet. <laughs> Unless they respond from, I don't know, from the next state. Well, Georgia's constitutional carry now. Ohio's constitutional carry. Uh, well, someone will respond at some point. I would hope so. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised around here. <laughs> Hopefully it's not going to be a submachine gun or something. I don't have one yet. Yeah, neither do I. But that's something to aspire to, huh? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> ah, did you see that? Uh, did, did you see that video with Mr. Zelensky with questionable substances on the table? What are your thoughts on that one? Well, I did see it, <laughs> <laughs> and it was kind of odd. We we watched. Uh, the video from Sergei Lavrov before that, where he mentioned that uh, you know, somebody asked uh, the interviewer asked him the question about using nuclear weapons, and he said, uh, she said that you know, Zelensky has said that you would use nuclear weapons. What are your thoughts on that? And Lavrov replied, "Well, he says a lot of things depending on what he's drinking or smoking." <laughs> <laughs> and then we saw the video with. And I guess we should tell the viewers about that, but there was questionable substances, and yeah. Mr. Zelensky looked like he was not all with it. Yeah. A little too excited, maybe. Kind of. Um, yeah, so that, that alone raises a lot of questions, really. Um, because one could first assume that, well, Lavrov is just saying things and just, you know, poking fun at Zelensky, but, you know, when you see that other video, you're like, well, I don't know, maybe there's some truth to it, or maybe it's actually true. And it's not the first odd thing we've seen about Zelensky, and, mm -hmm. I mean, we saw that one, I don't know if it was a television ad or what it was, where he was dancing? I don't know, what is it, it might have been like a television ad for some perfume, or That's like kind a music, of what it looked like, like yeah, very artistic, I'll go yeah. with that. Let's, let's put it that way, yeah, very artistic, artistic, if I may be so bold as to say. <laughs> yeah. Artistic, but strange, but pretty strange. Definitely strange. Um, yeah, I mean, they could have hired girls, maybe, or something. Yes. That was a little kind of, huh? What was that? <laughs> um, risque. Mm hmm. For a male to be. Risque, you mean? Risque. Yeah. <laughs> For a male to be dancing that way, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Swiveling all over the place. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know me, I'm not, I'm not really a prude or anything like that, but that's kind of like. You know, uh, if it was just some dude, whatever, you know, in an ad, like, who cares? Right. But then when this same dude uh, is a comedian, right? Stand-up comic. Stand-up comic. Uh, then he runs for president of Ukraine, and he doesn't actually have any campaign, really. Uh, it, it all consists of uh, his uh, comedy routines. That's what I understand, yeah. Yes, and... Videotaped, uh, distributed through social media. Yeah. And nothing else, like no program, no vision, nothing at all. No platform, yeah, um, not a lot of policy matters discussed. Nothing. Yeah, no, nothing like that at all. And then also the same guy, the same guy violates the Minsk agreements, 
then the same guy um, doesn't stop bloodshed in eastern Ukraine and then the same guy also is found well what looks like questionable substances uh, that paints a rather I don't know what word to use. What kind of picture does that paint? Well, throw into the equation his use of uh, offshore companies to launder money, as well as his connections to other bureaucrats in the United States. Oh, yeah. And three-letter agencies. Yeah, I guess to me what was a uh, red flag right away, because I, I honestly didn't know a lot about Zelensky. I didn't either. At all. So we like, started digging in. Who the in. heck is it, right? But the first thing that caught my attention is that Zelensky mentioned Justin Trudeau as his major inspiration to become a politician. Well, that should tell you something. Yes. If I was going to aspire to be a politician, Justin Trudeau would not be the first guy I would try to emulate. Yeah. Um, I, I would hope, though, that you would not aspire to become a politician. You didn't know? Uh, you are running for... Kentucky. Mayor of Jeffersonville. Oh! You didn't know. No, I didn't I know. I you didn't you. tell me. Yeah. Wow, when have you made this decision? It's about three weeks ago. I'm oh. an independent party candidate. So now you're going to come out as an independent party I'm candidate. I'm going to come out as an independent, yeah. <laughs> I tried being a Democrat, it didn't work. Uh, I tried being a Republican, and nah. Yeah. So I think I'm going to go with independent. Yeah, I'm actually airing on that side of things, too, because the more yeah. I think about it, the more I feel like this two-party system is some sort of major setup, really. You know, I was having that conversation with our friend Anthony Page the other mm -hmm. day, and Anthony says the same thing. You know, there's, There needs to be more than two parties, and I kind of agree with him. I'd like to see a libertarian party. There was actually a libertarian candidate that ran for um, the seat... Um, in the last election for state senate, I believe, mm. that I voted for because I didn't want to vote for the Democrat or the Republican. Yeah. I looked the guy up. He seemed like a decent dude. And I said, okay, libertarian, get my vote. Well, it's, you know, the way I feel about it is if these two parties were actually working, then, you know, I could have maybe picked one or something like that but since we know very well that there is plenty of rhinos out there and generally speaking i guess i'm kind of not fine with the do not the do nothing republicans you know <clears throat> well that's just it neither party is doing the job mm -hmm. because they tend to blend together into this one uniparty faction that is just boils down to de-establishment yeah, just the establishment. We need new blood. Yeah. I don't know if it's another party or two more parties, and, but we need fresh blood out there. Um, people, when it comes time for midterms, let me tell you something. This is your chance to make a difference. You got to get out and vote. You want to primary these establishment rhinos and dinos. Get them out of there. Whoever's running against them, vote for the other guy. Mitch McConnell, if I see his name on one more ballot, I'm going to throw up, honestly. Yeah. Um, I don't care who's running against him. It could be Joe Smith, the lawnmower repairman down the street. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Joe Smith's going to get my vote. Yeah. We need to get these establishment politicians out of office. I would love to see term limits. What's oh. your feeling on term limits? Oh, absolutely. Do you think it's ever going to happen, though? Because who gets to vote on those bills? You know. The establishment politicians. <laughs> yeah. That's like saying, all right, we'll take a pay cut. They're never going to vote on that either. Yeah. You know, I, however, feel, the way I feel about it is that um, I think that it rather should happen. It's not a matter of uh, is it necessary at all. It's a matter of that it should happen. Because if it does not happen, if the system is not rectified, then it's doomed. I don't remember who, but it was brought up about a year ago, and it, and it got to the floor, and then it died. And mm -hmm. I haven't heard one more thing about it since then. It was actually a uh, term limit reform bill. I don't remember who sponsored it, but it was there, and it went nowhere. There's the general feeling that I have about 
about the whole system that if it is not um, if it is not cleansed big time little adjustments are not going to save anything well and this is why I'm encouraging the people to get out and primary the establishment politicians you know I'm a big fan of Tim Pool he's been talking about this a lot and I, I, I totally down with this theory there's only one way we're going to break up the monopoly here and that's to get out and be active mm -hmm. do things like we're doing here share your thoughts with your friends your family your co-workers but tell them to get out and vote and get rid of the establishment that's what's dragging us down yep uh so yeah i feel like um unless the system is cleansed big time it's uh basically doomed and given you know all the other circumstances um that that i mean we have right now in america i mean all the other issues all of that um it can all crumble big time and uh we might not recover if we don't fix these things so i think it's crucial it's not a matter of just you know party preference or anything like that no if we do not cleanse the system so that it actually starts working we're in big trouble that's how i feel about it I'm a big believer in the U.S. Constitution. I would like to see it upheld. And if the current Democrats and Republicans aren't going to do it, then we need to find some politicians that will. Yeah. The question is, will politicians do it? Or who's supposed to do it? Maybe, uh, you know, I, I kind of feel that, you know, it would be so cool to vote in people who are not professional politicians. Well, that's a good point, too. Like Trump. Who was not a politician, who was a businessman. Who is a businessman. Devoting people who are qualified to run things actually make them work. Not all of these, you know, politics and behind the curtains kind of, you know, whatever. Not all of that, but actually to make things work. You did a hell of a good job with the economy here. I mean, gas prices were, what, under $2 a gallon? Yeah, $1.65, Yeah, $1.79, like yeah. you know, it's mm -hmm. very reasonable. Um, the thing about bringing industry back to the United States was crucial, too. Uh, we've seen the effects of that going downhill since the uh, start of the COVID yeah. pandemics. Um, we couldn't get protective gear, masks, gloves. Yeah. The things that the government was telling you, you need to wear a mask, you mm -hmm. need to wear gloves. We couldn't get them. If yeah. you could get them, they were crazy expensive. Yeah. And then they started shipping that from China. Exactly. Because it turned out that the United States doesn't have manufacturing power to make those, even those things ourselves. Which is pretty embarrassing, you know. It's not just about embarrassment, it's also, it's also just, it reveals how, you know, in how much of trouble, of a trouble we are, I think. Very much so. I mean, I understand, like, global economy, global trade, you know, all of that kind of stuff, like, yeah, everything is integrated, it's so cool. I don't think it's that cool in that sense. It's cool when the country is self-sufficient sufficiently to a sufficient extent when we can provide for ourselves and at the same time when we can be open we can trade and we can you know do this kind of stuff but when there are entire uh, entire segments of the economy which are totally dependent right. on the whim of some other country right that's friggin nuts computer chips pharmaceuticals yeah. things like this that are crucial yeah I've heard uh, stories of people that have ordered cars um, eight, nine, ten months ago, mm -hmm. still waiting on delivery of their car. Damn. Why? Because they can't get the chips for the computers. Mm -hmm. They're made in China, Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, things were kind of simpler, I guess, in the, the older days when cars were simpler. Well, yeah. Everything's got to be computerized, and somebody's got to make the chips for those computers. Uh huh. Why aren't they made here in the United States? Why? Yeah. Sometimes I think I wish, uh, if I was to pick a car, I would pick something like a, a Chevy Impala, for example. From the 70s, I hope. Yeah. Yes, yes. 
from the seventies, of course. Yeah. You know? uh, or maybe a truck, a Ford truck. You know, again, the old school Ford truck, the real one. But getting back to Ukraine, what do you think about? Um, do you wanted to say something? I wanted to talk about the video that we saw with Sergey Lavrov. Yeah, well, let's. The, with, yeah, that guy kind of. Yeah. Um, Lavrov is Russian foreign minister. Yeah. And as you know, Kat and I have done three videos now on the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and we gather bits and pieces of information from a lot of different sources. But we're still trying to put the puzzle together, you know? And it's a big puzzle and it's very complicated. There's a lot of different angles, there's a lot of propaganda, there's a lot of diversion. One side says something, the other side says the opposite. So we look at both sides, that's very important. Last night we looked at Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, and it was amazing to hear him talk on the exact same points that we presented in three videos. Yeah. It seemed like he watched our videos and then summarized. Yeah. It was just insane. It's kind of eerie, you know. It kind of confirms that we were digging in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, something about uh, where the dog dug, what's that expression? Uh, 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 yeah, the, the, this is a Russian expression that means like, ah, got you, that's, that's what it really means or that's what it really is. So the, it would translate as, this is where the dog dug. But there was things that we were doubting as we were presenting these videos even, you know, we, we're not sure. We're not full-time political science researchers here, but we know what we see and hear and feel that might be correct. So in, in doing a job as amateur journalists, we tried to be objective and pre present both sides of the equation. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you go out on a limb and you say, well, I heard that there's this Nazi battalion called the Azov Battalion. Yeah. And this is not something you're going to see on CNN or MSCCP, for example. MSCCP, <laughs> I love that one. Yeah. Um, they're not going to be telling you that there's Nazis in Ukraine. And uh, to hear Mr. Lavrov say this after yeah. our speculation, and I mean, we've even shown their logo before and he went out and described the exact same thing you know? yeah everything that we have uh, researched and seen on our own from other sources not from Russian sources actually even the supposed Bucha massacre yeah he said the, they gave the exact same timeline that we yeah. gave damn it and we'll link this video from Lavrov you, you folks should really take a look at it yeah, he speaks It may English. be an eye-opener. We'll put it down here in the description down below here. Yep. But it, it's a good watch. Um, He's giving an interview to some uh, Indian channel. Yeah, it's an Indian TV channel. Yeah. A nice Indian lady. Um, it's very <laughs> interesting to hear the different accents because she's naturally has the Indian accent. And Labrop is actually very good English. I was impressed. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. So, it's a good watch. I think you'll, you know, if you were doubting anything that we were saying that might be credible, and I'm not saying that Sergey Lavrov is incapable of lying, but if I was a judge on a jury trial, I would instruct you to weigh the evidence and give it the weight which it deserves. You have to look at things like the demeanor of the witness, the credibility of the witness. Is what he's saying realistic? Is he being emotional at all? Labrov was not emotional. He was not nervous. He was not sweating. He was not shaking. He looked totally credible in everything he said. Yeah. And that's an important thing because, um, you know, what the other side loves to do, and the other side, I mean the uh, Western libtards. Yeah. Uh, what they love to do is they present things in a very emotional way. They kind of neglect the fact and the nitty-gritty and they're like, well, you know, that doesn't really matter. Just look at this. This is so horrible. And they slap some headline 
you know, and they print out something. Like, do you remember that Bucha massacre, right? Sure. What they did, you've probably seen those pictures. So, in all of this Western, you know, um, British media, uh, American media, they've printed in magazines and gazettes and newspapers all of these flashy headlines, basically the same pictures, right? Oh, yeah. Which we don't know. Are they even from Bucha? Are they even from that part of Ukraine? Who knows? However, right, these same pictures made it to the headlines and they expect, the media expects, an emotional response. They're not presenting an accurate story. They're not interested. They're interested in catchy headlines. They're interested in getting an emotional response from the audience. That's what they're after. Well, we've heard this since day one of this conflict. Russia's bad. Yeah, Russia's bad. Russia's of evil. Course, of Putin course, is Russia. Satan. Yeah, Putin is Satan, etc., etc., etc. Which alone, you know, for me, that, that alone indicates that something is horribly wrong uh, when, you know, the mainstream media just unanimously decides that someone is evil. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why. I think killing your own citizens is evil. Yes, that's evil. And this has been going on for eight years in Ukraine, yeah. folks. If you listen to Mr. Labrov, well, then, you know, we'll, we will link that video down yes. below here. But you really should pay attention to the timeline. And he gives a lot of information of what led up to February 24th, was it? Uh, yes, I think it was February the 24th. Beginning of the invasion. Yeah. I want you to listen to what he says and judge it. I know that the other side, that the that the libtards, right, in Western media, they're trying to, I mean, all of these um, quote-unquote progressive outlets, bloggers, um, quote-unquote journalists, they mock the what Lavrov is saying, and they're trying to present it like, oh, they're making it up, ha, 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 Putin is crazy, uh, the Russians are crazy, they claim that uh, if they wouldn't, it, would they have not attacked and invaded, right, then the, Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian side would have attacked them. Uh, ha ha ha, that's so funny. Uh, how ridiculous, right? Uh, yeah. What are they crazy? Why are they claiming stuff like this? And there is a lot of this, you know, like, oh, they're making up this. Uh, all the world, the, the whole world sees that that can be true. However, Putin they, is insane. Putin uh, is sick. He's ill. He's desperate. Yeah. And we were talking about this last evening, right? You know, yeah. with um, um, regardless of how much I personally might not like Putin and might not like, you know, the way things are structured in Russia and um, a lot of those things. It's just not my cup of tea, you know. But however, yeah. I got to give credit where credit is due. And uh, in this situation, in the historic context of what's happening there right now, you know, it's impossible to ignore and kind of forget, you can't throw it out of the window, that NATO was expanding to the east for quite a while now. And um, that expansion was happening, what, in five waves, right? Sure. So things really escalated after the uh, dissolution of the USSR. And apparently, uh, NATO was more than... NATO and us, well, our establishment, were more than interested in uh, getting their claws into the ex-Soviet republics, right? The newborn independent states, such as Ukraine, of course, the Baltic states, of course, Georgia as well. Of course, the Caucasus region. Yeah. So, w which is only like, why would that not be reasonable to even look into? That's the first thing you, one should look into to understand the context of what's going on today. Like, whatever is happening right now in Ukraine, it didn't happen just on a whim. Um, no, it is the active uh, phase, I don't know what to call it, the hot phase of a, a chain of conflicts, right, uh, embedded in a larger context that led up to this point in time. And as it turns out, um, people like Zelensky uh, weren't really trying to avert this event. Absolutely. Zelensky didn't... Zelensky violated the Minsk agreements. Yeah. Zelensky didn't want to go and talk to Putin, sit down, you know, and have a conversation with Putin on one side and with NATO on the other side and figure out an actual workable solution for this eastern 
uh, for uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, right? Right. No, that didn't happen. Instead of that, um, Zelensky pretended that, oh, we didn't know that Russia is going to invade. Oh, really, you didn't. So you were shelling uh, Zelensky and people who back him up, right? Zelensky formally is in power not for long, really. What is it, a year and a half? 2019. Yeah, but people December. who back yeah. up Zelensky and people, the forces, uh, the, the powers that were shelling uh, eastern Ukraine for eight years, they were doing this all the time and nobody was uh, making any, uh, any fuss about this. What did Zelensky do to stop... Nothing. ...the Azov Battalion, the Donbass Battalion, uh, the... The other one in the south that I uh, don't remember the name. Um, there's multiple militias involved in this that have kind of loosely formed to to become the Ukraine military force. Mm -hmm. The Izov Battalion is actually the National Guard. Okay. Yeah. These are the people that are killing civilians in Donbas because they speak Russian. Yeah, because they and speak they want Russian. to align with Russia. Yeah, and it's a complicated situation because, uh, remember, we looked into why is that situation, uh, why did it happen this way to begin with? Is because who, Stalin or, uh, I don't remember who was that Soviet leader, was it Stalin, yeah? Who misplaced the population of um, Eastern Ukrainians. Well, that's the root of this problem, yes. yeah. I mean, say that the United States had been in um, an alignment with um, California, Washington, and Oregon, all right? Mm -hmm. And we had dissolved at one point, and somebody drew a boundary line mm -hmm. and said, those West Coast states are no longer part of the United States, all right? Let's, mm -hmm. let's picture this for a second. Yeah. Now, what if the... Uh, became under attack by supposedly a friendly force. And the United States did nothing to step in and to, to stop that. Yeah. You see the scenario I'm putting forth here? Uh-huh, yeah. So, um, I don't know, all of this uh, looks to me pretty, well, it, it all looks very shady and um, I can't blame, really, the more I think about it, the more I can't really blame Russians for what they are doing, you know, in Ukraine. The question of nuclear weapons keeps coming up, too, and Lavrov made a very interesting point last night about Donald Trump. Um, let's go back to Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan back in... What was that? In the 80s, mid 80s, mm -hmm. I believe. 85. You can check me on the data. 85 sounds pretty close. They had uh, worked out a nuclear agreement where they said, look, we're going to stand down. We're not going to use nuclear weapons. And Russia had reached out to the United States many times to reinforce this agreement. Under Donald Trump, they had asked several times, and Trump kept telling them no. I'm not going to sign off on not using nukes against you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to. I'm not going to sign up. Trump refused. For four years, Trump refused. And people ask, "Well, geez, you know, how come they didn't invade Ukraine when Trump was president?" I think that's a pretty damn good reason, right there. Yeah. It took five days of the Biden administration for them to sign that nuclear restriction agreement with Russia, mm -hmm. and within a year. Ukraine is invaded by Russia. Yep. Just another interesting fact that surfaces. It's kind of a strange uh, place that I find myself in because you know, when I was leaving Russia, I definitely was not a fan of Putin. I'm still not a fan of Putin. I'm know. not a fan of Putin either. <clears throat> yeah, but as I said, you know, Probably. But on the other hand, I'm not going to jump through hoops to celebrate how wonderful Zelensky is. And yeah, me neither. Cry the, the blues over what's going on in Ukraine right now. Yeah, I mean, and with all of this being said, I do have genuine uh, empathy for the people of Ukraine. Absolutely. Because at this point, the way, kind of the picture that I see is that Ukraine basically was used 
by the Western elites as a pawn, quite literally. That they've, uh, they've positioned the Ukrainian elite. They put them in position so that they would run the show, you know, and do exactly as they are told. I think there's a whole lot of interference by many Western countries in Ukraine. Everybody's trying to milk whatever they can. Mm -hmm. Resources, technology, money laundering, yeah, human trafficking, drug trafficking. It's all going on in Ukraine. Biological, a, biological research, yeah. And it's all covered up by mainstream media. Yeah, and they just wouldn't talk about it. We've seen a lot of things in our research. We have no reason to believe that these things are false or fake. There is just too much of it. Yeah. You know, there's just too much of it, and I do not really believe in coincidence, you know, because, yeah. look, when you have, like, you look from one angle, you find a piece of something, you're like, wait a second, really? And then you see something, the other end of that same thing, you see it from an absolutely different source. Then you look into 10 more sources and you see traces of the same stuff and you're like, there is something probably to it. And then you start digging and then you uncover all of a sudden that actually it's a huge thing. And various sources have various um, little angles. Someone has more, someone has less. And then you also notice, <clears throat> interestingly, that uh, mainstream journalists, quote unquote journalists, right they didn't even try to go there they don't even talk about this it's like a um, it's taboo yeah. it's taboo yeah can't talk about it for some reason and actually then you realize that they spin a narrative that is absolutely in contradiction to things that you at this point have established to be real right so that raises a lot of questions then you start to ask yourself okay so why are they exactly doing this and that raises a greater question, um, well, what is the function of mainstream media, right? Well, they're an arm of the government. <laughs> right. Who's the head of our government? Yes. So then there is a... Whose son used to his, the influence of his then vice president father to gain a seat on a board of a petroleum company in Ukraine and yep. bring home $87,000 a month? Yep. Um, The same guy that had many dealings with Chinese businessmen and oligarchs. Yep. Bank transactions, millions of dollars changing hands. Mm -hmm. So then that begs the question, uh, what is, um, what are the Western governments really up to? So there is a lot of questions, you know, a lot of questions. And uh, I, I think that when you understand when you ask those questions and when you generally do understand the gist of the direction, the vector, right? Then when something like Bucha happens, instead of just taking it at face value, you already know that you can't really, because you understand the motivations of the people who push a certain narrative, right? right. So when all of a sudden all the Western media uh, immediately, four days later, right after the Russians left Bucha, they started uh, started shrieking about um, war crimes committed by Russians. Just all of a sudden, it went absolutely wild. Now that you know the possible motivations of you know of the Western elites, and when you understand that they are backing Zelensky, now it's not just a clear-cut story anymore and you can't just just believe it in the meantime what's being done to resolve the situation we had some talks in Turkey yeah that Did apparently they... Ukraine somewhat agreed to then backed out of mm-hmm they were late to various talks, didn't show up for other talks that were scheduled in Belarus. So I can understand they didn't want to go to Belarus. Mm -hmm. Okay, but Turkey. 
So what's become of those agreements? Nothing? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Well, apparently they do have some uh, talks. They have to have some communications and some talks about, you know, the exchange of POWs. That happens. I've seen uh, lists of people that were exchanged, you know, like 38, um, 38 for 20 something plus this and that, you know, this kind of stuff. So they are in touch, but I don't know what is what is being done indeed to ultimately resolve this situation. What is NATO doing? Oh, What's the European Union doing? What's the United States doing? They're sending What's more, Joe Biden doing? They're sending in more weapons. And Zelensky is asking for more Why are they sending more in more... Why do you think they're sending more weapons? Because they want to continue with the war. They don't want the war to be over with. And why is that? Well, I think in part I've heard an interesting opinion from um, a lady who's like a, a journalist, I guess, a reporter. Hmm. She's from... Luhansk, I think. Okay. She's uh, an ethnic Ukrainian. All right. And uh, she's been a refugee um, for these past eight years, exactly because of the events that are happening in eastern Ukraine. So currently she's in Egypt, and she's doing these live streams. Uh, all right. So she's answering a lot of questions. She has interesting takes on these topics. So she. What does she call Zelensky, by the way? Zelensky. Ah, uh, she calls him. She calls him Zelenobobik. Which, uh, loosely translated in English, would be a uh, green puppy. <laughs> green puppy. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. I, I wanted to get that fact out. <laughs> yeah. She, she, also, she also alleges that the people who run things in Ukraine currently, and she's not talking about the actual Ukrainian people. No, she's talking about the uh, Ukrainian elite. She calls them Salareich which Sala in Russian or in uh, Ukrainian means lard. And Reich, I think you know what, what that means in German, right? Like, as in Third Reich, for example. So you have Lard Reich. <laughs> That's Green right. puppy and the Lard Reich. <laughs> yes. I love it. Green puppy and the Lard Reich. So, um, well, she alleges, for example, I think that's a valid point that she makes that uh, currently Ukraine is being used as um, uh, testing grounds for all of these new weapons that are being supplied by Western countries. Uh, why? Because the military-industrial complex says of these countries, including us, too, um, is interested in weapon sales. And how can you sell weapons if you don't have any demonstrations, if you don't have any, uh, what do you call it, um, any testing, right? On top of that, why would anybody buy new weapons if you got old weapons around that are cheaper? Yeah. And while we've agreed that nobody's going to sell old weapons that don't function anymore, you have weapons that are on the borderline of usefulness, and yeah. why not get rid of them to make room for the new stuff? Mm -hmm. There is a lot of interesting stuff going on. You know, yeah. i got to tell you, I have, in hindsight, I'm, as we're looking, that's like an adjacent topic, but that's not a, an adjacent region, Afghanistan. Sure. The withdrawal, the absolutely butchered withdrawal of uh, American troops from Afghanistan. I'm still wondering why did Sleepy Joe leave all of these weapons to Taliban? A lot of questions. A lot of questions, because now I'm hearing from some sources that the Taliban, there is a possibility that they might take over Tajikistan, which is the next Soviet Republic. Yep. Tajikistan just happens to be right between Uzbekistan and um, Kyrgyzstan, as far as I remember, and there is China to the east. There is a corridor that leads right across the border into mm -hmm. China. More than that, to the north, there is Kazakhstan. So, I don't know, that begs a lot of questions. What, um, why did it happen so that uh, our Brandon administration left all of these stockpiles of weapons to Taliban, who now has the opportunity, perhaps a better opportunity, to try to do something in Tajikistan? I don't know. But that's its own kind of can of worms. I mean, so all of this stuff with the military, military industrial complex, all this stuff with weapons, a large amount of weapons going somewhere, 
and then some groups seizing control of those weapons, and then those weapons resurfacing elsewhere. So many questions. The Taliban have the largest armed forces in the region at this point. Yeah. Because of what we left for them. Yeah. Largest and best armed. Uh-huh. Yep. I guess we couldn't send them tons of money, so we had to leave them something for a departing gift. Yeah, yeah do you remember that there was a meme uh, a, a Taliban dude calling calling Joe on the phone yeah. and asking him about uh, his, uh, what, manual, uh, operational manual for for the Humvee or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, or... Good point. Yeah, something like that, and Joe, I don't, I don't remember the meme, yeah, something like that. So, uh, with Ukraine, I just think, I don't know if we're going to wrap up this topic, because we, we sort of, I guess this time we're kind of generally speaking about all of these things. Uh, there is a lot. So we're not, I guess, not sticking to a uh, particular uh, part of this large topic. I guess uh, maybe the purpose of this episode is to point out to people who are uh, unaware that there is uh, a lot. There is so much and people really need to understand this before jumping the gun or <coughs> excuse me getting to any conclusions or just blindly like some love to just blindly alleging that you know oh Zelensky of course is a hero or you know Putin is you know evil incarnate or something along those lines like no the situation is really complex and it has a rich history uh, there was a lot of events that led up to the current situation and, um, and again, listen to the video with Sergei Lavrov. Yes. If you don't understand the history there, Lavrov nails it. You know, we piece this together over three or four episodes now, but he'll give it to you within 20 minutes, and it's clear. Yeah. And it's credible, and it's yes. real, and it's the truth. And by the way, we know that it is the truth because exactly because we were doing our research. Because yeah. for the past, what, three years or so, yeah. we were digging up uh, stuff on corruption, criminality, as far as Western corruption and criminality. So when uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, uh, mentioned something and the bell goes off and we're like, wow, yeah. we knew about this. This is the other side, the Russians, right, the other side, that it turns out knows the same stuff that we know. How did that happen? Why do they know it? Maybe there is weight Maybe there is a lot more weight to what we ourselves have discovered independently before this hot phase in Ukraine even started. We knew about uh, the Biden family, the Biden family's dealings in Ukraine. We knew about this beforehand. A lot of people didn't want to know about this or didn't want to listen about this. We knew about it two years ago. Yes, we knew about it. We couldn't imagine perhaps the scope of this and uh, the involvement that it's not just the Biden family, it's the you know, Brandon family. Let's, let's be correct here. Brandon Ooh. family, right? We but, knew that there was a Ukrainian prosecutor that was looking into the functioning of Burisma Holdings. Yeah. We knew that there was a phone call between Joe Biden yeah. <laughs> and yeah. an official in Ukraine that said, we need to get that guy fired or else you're not getting your million dollars in aid. Yes. Actually, Joe was bragging about this. He did. He did. We got a video of that, too. Yes. <laughs> yes. The guy was yeah. literally bragging about this. You know, that's we've heard the term quid pro Joe here for a while. This is where it came from, folks. You know, mm -hmm. you do something for me, and I'll do something for you. That's a little Latin expression called quid pro quo, or tit for tat. Just yeah. for that. Yes, yes. And um, I guess, I, I don't know. I guess we will link the videos, the relevant videos. And... Um, we're going to wrap it up here. I think so. It's a good spot to do it. Yeah. So I think we would like to invite you to our Telegram channels, uh, the links to which, again, will be found in the description, because we can post there stuff that we cannot really post here on YouTube, not because we're scared or anything, but mostly because YouTube will, you know, shadow ban us or whatever. Right. Um, we can't post it on Facebook. We can't post it on Twitter. We just get thrown off. Uh, Cat's already off Facebook. And yeah. I'm next. So it's, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So, um... Follow us on Telegram. If you want the truth, that's where we're putting it. 
Yeah, or, you know... On a daily basis, we're sharing through our <coughs> Telegram channels things that you aren't going to see anywhere else. Yeah, and, and it's not that we're claiming that we're like the ultimate experts or anything no. like this. No! We're in the process of no. researching these but things. But we look. We actively look we for look. things. We try to find yeah. the truth. I think that's very important. Yeah. Uh, I think it's kind of... Um, it's always su suspicious, you know, when someone claims that I know everything about it. I'm like, uh, I don't know. Like, uh, maybe some wishful thinking is involved or yeah. maybe some lying is involved. But when someone is genuinely trying to dis discover, you know, do genuine discovery and um, find out the truth, I think, you know, I would like to just invite you to join us on this journey. Come on along. Yeah. We appreciate you all. Thanks for watching Redneck TV with Cat and Scott. Thank you. One other thing I want to add, Kat's new album is out. Uh, I think on our last episode, we, we, we were talking about, it, you know, a couple days from release, whatever. It's already out there now. Love and Space, Catherine Corelli, YouTube, uh, Spotify. The links are down here in the description. Yes. And I think, as usual, we want to invite you to check out our Southern Caracol products, which are soap bars and shampoo bars, lotions, bath bombs even, lip bombs, and all, stuff, all sorts of wonderful all natural goodness. Yeah, should I say tasty? <laughs> no, tasty, yeah. delicious. No, you're, you're, yeah. not, you're not supposed to eat that though. Everybody wants to. And you cherry can't, almond is delicious. Yeah, but you can't. Uh, you I want to eat that. You can't yeah. say tasty because you're not supposed to eat it. And you can't say sniffy because then you come across as creepy Jill. You know, you can't. <laughs> or Kamala. <laughs> or Kamala. Oh my God. <laughs> you say tasty. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Uh, uh, anyways, anyways, folks, uh, thanks for joining us on Redneck TV. Yes, see you next time. Love y'all. Love y'all. Have a wonderful day.